Some things are easily observable in the desert. The unobstructed vistas can stretch out for tens and even hundreds of miles. It can be very tough to guess just how far away or how close things can be. And whenever there is something going on, dust just gets thrown up into the air. You can see it for miles, and the dust cloud is carried downwind. The column of a little dust devil can be seen for miles. The dust from a pickup driving along a dirt road or a construction site. And even a dirt bike zipping along a trail miles away can be seen. And you may be so far from the source of the dust, you have no idea what is kicking it up. The winds of an approaching thunderstorm can throw up a veil that obscures the storm clouds themselves. Then those billions of little particles floating around get stripped out of the air by the rain to be deposited on what had been your clean car. Sometimes we call this phenomenon a mud storm. Looking out to the rest of the world, it is true that activity kicks up dust that drifts about until somewhere downwind it again falls to the ground. This happens literally and figuratively. But you can't always see it. Everything that happens has an impact on whatever is downwind. Downwind in geography or in time. A black sky. There had been a few thunderstorms in the region, with flashes of lightning overnight. For now, it was quiet, but the sky remained black. For now. In the shallow Jornada del Muerto Valley, this Spanish phrase translated to English means dead man's journey or root of the dead man. It is located in an isolated desert region of the Tularosa Basin in the southwestern United States, one of those places that is about as far away from everything as it is possible to be. Then, just before dawn, there was a bright flash of light, brighter than ten suns, fiercely emanating up and out of the little valley. Anyone who may have been looking from Little Burrow Peak about 10 miles away or even 20 miles away up on Capitol Peak would have been blinded by this overwhelming burst without eye protection. So strong and intense was this light that even if one had covered their face with their hands, they would have been able to see the bones inside their hands. One who had planned and was prepared to be there to watch this deeply secretive event described it as a biblical experience. There rose from the bowels of the earth a light not of this world, a light of many suns in one. It was as though the earth had opened and the skies had split. One felt as though one were present at the moment of creation when God said, let there be light. Immediately after came an overwhelming and blistering heat and then a shock wave, and then a sound that was too loud to hear, but it could be felt. Has the world gone crazy? That initial flash was so bright that a blind girl in the town of Socorro, about a hundred miles away, was able to see it and asked, what was that? Twelve young girls from nearby Ruidoso were asleep in a cabin. They were camping together. The twelve to fourteen-year-olds were awakened as they were tossed out of their bunks onto the floor by the shockwave. They instinctively rushed out of the cabin, fearing that perhaps the water heater had exploded. Barbara Kent, one of the young campers, said in an interview with National Geographic, there was a big cloud and lights in the sky. It hurt our eyes. It was as if the sun came out. Tremendous. The whole sky turned strange. But there was no explanation. No one in the region who experienced that remarkable event had any idea of what had just occurred, save the military and the government officials who made it happen. 
and frankly even some of them were grateful, that the whole world didn't end as a few had theorized it might. The point of origin for the flash and tremendous explosion was about as remote as it could be, yet even in the 1945 desert southwest there were nearly half a million people within a 150 mile radius. It is unlikely that anyone who was already awake at about 545 on July 16th could have missed it, and those who were not awake would have been unlikely to sleep through it. In a few hours, the sun rose over the cabin where the girls were camped, and they were in awe of what looked like gigantic flakes of snow that began falling from the sky. Barbara Kent, one of those campers, later said, The girls were grabbing the white flakes and putting it all over ourselves, pressing it on our faces. But the strange thing, instead of being cold like snow, it was hot. And we all thought, well, the reason it's hot is because it's summer. We were only 13. We didn't know any better. So they danced around in the shallow creek nearby, catching hot snow on their tongues, laughing and splashing about, just as any other group of happy kids would. The hot snow continued to fall in the region for days. What was that? Shortly after the event, the U.S. military claimed there had been an explosion of a large amount of explosives, ammunition, and pyrotechnics. Most just accepted the explanation and went on with their lives as they always had. Once later, everyone knew that bright flash in July of 1945 was the Trinity test, the detonation of the first nuclear bomb. And then people began to understand that the loss of cattle and other livestock immediately after and closer to the blast was not just a strange coincidence. And in the following years, there was an astronomical and tragic increase in infant mortality rates. And so many folks were getting cancer. Could this suffering in the towns and counties surrounding the shallow Jonarda del Muerto Valley in the Tularosa Basin happen because of Trinity? A large portion of the New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah deserts were not at all unfamiliar with the nuclear snow that fell downwind of the ongoing tests that continued for decades. They were assured if they stayed out of it and brushed it or washed it away, it was perfectly safe. However, specific cancers became much more common throughout those regions in the years that passed after that first and the subsequent years of testing of nuclear weapons. And one of the young campers, though she had been afflicted by several types of cancer during her lifetime, Barbara Kent noted that by the time she was 30, she was the only one of the teenage girls at the camp who was still alive. Today, we know, through formerly classified documents, that the United States government knew the situation was not at all benign, and that hundreds of thousands of lives of the downwinders had been, and yet will be, impacted. Fallout The fallout, pardon the pun, from the Trinity test has been described as one of those things where those who knew pretended not to know, and those who were not in the know knew. But nobody wanted to look at the facts too hard for fear of litigation. Some in fear of being imprisoned for revealing top secret information, and others for not wanting to be embarrassed and end up paying damages. The government was willing to pay for studies on the effects of the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki but in some ways, they seem to pretend Trinity and the other nuclear test never happened. Then, in the 1990s, the U.S. Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. This provided $50,000 to each of those who had been exposed to the radioactive fallout 
of the hundred or more tests conducted in the Nevada desert. But the civilian victims of the Trinity test, they're excluded from this compensation. Do some decision makers in our government operate within the unethical parameter that certain human test rats are more valuable than others? Perhaps I should not have asked that question out loud. The shameful attempt to cover up in denial of the effects of the Trinity and the multiple Nevada nuclear tests are made worse because an authority that had been given our trust betrayed us. It is not the first time this has happened. It has happened before. It will happen again. And it is most likely happening right now. Today. It is in the nature of organizations to try to protect themselves. This nature is magnified by the fact that some horrible consequences are completely unanticipated and sometimes not known or legitimately not recognized until much later. And when the ugly unknowns of the stuff that was drifting downwind come to light, they are often not acknowledged or denied to save money and save face. Well, there are potentially many little outsized nuggets of wisdom from this shocking but true tale. But for now, might I suggest just this one. Here's an ounce from our brief examination of some of the injustices in history and the effects that continue to drift downwind. Absolutely no one gets through life without disappointment, discomfort, betrayal, and loss. Life will scuff everyone up, in many ways large and small. So what makes you think you should be the exception? But there is no joy in going through life mad because we haven't avoided some injustice, or in a paranoid belief that everyone and everything is out to get us, even if they are. It is a fearful, small, and isolated, and useless way to live. So, who can you trust? Well, I've learned that pretty much every human being or organization with humans in it will at some point let you down. No one will get through life without knowingly or unknowingly causing or receiving some level of betrayal. When betrayals happen, there are three questions to ask. Questions that must be answered if there's any chance to heal. 1. Can I forgive? If you cannot, you will never fully heal. That betrayal will continue to have power over you as a persistent, powerless image of an excuse. You will remain stuck. Number 2. Can I repair? Is there yet any value there? And... If there is, is it possible to make things right again? And number three, how do I continue on? The only useful answer here, don't dwell on it forever. Purposefully take control of you. Don't just survive, find joy and keep living. Everyone who is alive has an opportunity for joy and living. And that's it. An ounce submitted for your consideration. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. It is appreciated. And if you've gotten this far, why not just go ahead and hit that uh, like button or the subscribe button or share it with your friends. We need all the help we can get to convince YouTube's algorithm that we're worth watching. Thanks.